Okay, so we're on part three of the lecture. Um, so English graphic designer Jonathan Barnbrook created a series of what he calls um, Olympiques. They're basically pictograms, really simple um, graphics that he created for the Olympics of 2010, the actual Winter Games. And they are basically kind of a humorous jab at the um, overemphasis on advertising during the Olympics. Um, and this piece that we're going to take a look at is called Drowning in Advertising. And it was basically uh, available for free as a wallpaper for iPhones at that time. Um, and it basically kind of depicts this guy. Oh, I got to make this in presentation mode here. Um, this consumer basically is drowning in what looks to be this Coca Cola, really stripped down Coca Cola logo. Um, so he's kind of making commentary on on how the consumer is drowning in advertising. Um, you know, we can see his head here and the arm, and then this is like that stylized um, swish underneath the C on Coca-Cola, plus like the colors from the Coca-Cola logo are being used. So this was just basically an iPhone wallpaper. I think it's pretty clever. I actually went and looked up um, some other ones that he created. So here's some more examples. Um, the merchandise, ex extortionate, you know, extortionate, um, really expensive merchandise, bribable judges, uh, sweatshop sportswear. So sweatshops probably are making most of the clothing. Uh, Olympic debt, just a couple different examples that he created. So he did a whole set of these. I'm not quite sure exactly how many he did, but he did quite a few. Um, so those were done by Jonathan Barnbrook. He was an English designer. They were called Olympic Olympics. Um, and then we'll move on to book covers. And they basically, it's a pretty specialized field. And it hasn't really gone out of style, even with the rise of digital books. And so this is a, the next one we're going to be looking at is Janet Hansen's cover for Voices in the Night. And it basically suggests kind of a turned back bedsheet. And even though this is a digital book, it, um, digital reading devices still stimulate the turning of paper pages. So here we go. Here's the piece here. Actually uses a pretty strong, pretty strong use of a diagonal line here. Um, diagonal force, which is one of the principles. Um, and then we can see some elements of design here through just the use of line. Um, so there's a lot of line in here. And yep, this is by Janet Hansen, and it was a book cover from 2015. Um, oh, and actually the designer is, yeah, that, yeah, by Stephen Milhauser. He's the author of the book. So, okay, moving on, motion graphics. So what we've been talking about so far has been mostly still and static imagery, which would be considered graphic design, traditional 2D graphic design. But we're going to be moving into the field of motion graphics. And this is basically when a designer uses visual effects, live action, and animation to create a piece that is actually still two-dimensional, but it moves. And obviously, it needs a screen um, to be viewable. And they're time-based sequences. And they can be used on websites, television, um, opening title sequences of movies, and music videos. So those are popular places where you might see um, motion graphics. And this discipline actually started with title sequences in Hollywood at the beginning of the film, a lot of times back in the early, early days. It was just a roll of names coming down the screen for five minutes at the beginning of a movie. When in 1960, Saul Bass was one of the first people that actually was like, hey, we can actually take these title sequences that at first were just simple lists of names and actually kind of do something creative with them. And it actually can be used as sort of a, a way to create a climate for the story that's going to follow. So he, he was the first one that really took um, the title sequence and really took it to the next level as far as an art form goes. So I actually have an example of one of his title sequences here. So I'm going to open this up. 
Okay, we can watch this. Make it full screen. Pretty interesting use of imagery and text. I'll try and X out of this. It's got his, you know, sound as well, obviously. So this is done by Saul Bass in 1959, actually. So with the movie, um, can't remember what it's called. But anyway, I'll watch a little bit more of it. Anyways, this was kind of a revolutionary idea for the time, anyway. Uh, oh, Anatomy of a Murder. Yeah, that's what it was for. So, pretty interesting. He's got some other ones, too, um, that we could watch, but I thought I would just kind of keep it simple. This one's really early, 1959, so... Um, going back to our lecture... Let's see. Get this back into presentation mode. Um, another example is basically from the 90s, and it was one of the first movies that really also used, was using digital editing. Um, and it really ensure, and digital editing, editing really did ensure the takeoff of motion graphics, because motion graphics are done in the computer. Um, and digital, digital shot, digitally shot film and digital editing, and using the computer to do all those things, really did help to ensure the takeoff of motion graphics. Um, and I'm sorry about that. My stupid heater is going off. I'm just going to pause it till it's done. Okay, it stopped. <laughs> so, yeah, we're going to look at the 1990 film 7 by Kyle Cooper. And it definitely was one of the first films out there to use new technologies to create a title sequence. And this was basically a really dramatic crime story. Um, and it kind of has a plot of its own, this title sequence does. It's kind of about this man that's assembling this, like, booklet about murder and sexual deviance, and it's kind of showing images of film clips and um, this man's hands that are assembling this thing, and then, like, hand-lettered credits. And then the soundtrack is done by the band Nine Inch Nails. I don't know if you guys have heard of that, but it does actually go with the theme of the movie. Uh, and it's kind of a haunting close-up sequence um, that does have a function in the script. It actually introduces the body, the audience to the mind of the killer. And the killer doesn't appear in this film until 40 minutes into the film. So it does do a good job of kind of introducing the audience to how the killer's mind is working. So we'll take a look at this. We do have um, a still from the book. So this is the, a still from the title sequence for 7, 1995. It's pretty early. It doesn't do much, but it does look like, you know, maybe they took film and scratched into it. it. Looks like it's scratched into, and then here's another layer of film, and he's actually maybe pasting this into a page in the book. So there's kind of a lot of layering going on in this image. Um, but we'll actually watch a section of this really quickly just so you guys can see what the title sequence actually looks like. This isn't the best quality video. Yeah, it's really not the best quality video, but you get the point. There's Brad Pitt, he's actually in this movie. Blade. Morgan Freeman's in this movie. Pretty creepy movie. I'm not sure if you guys have seen it, but it's definitely a kind of a disturbing movie. So anyway, you get the you get the gist of what this is looking like. So, kind of a creepy, it's definitely got the mood going on in it for the whole movie, really. Um, so, there's actually another 
title sequence we're going to be looking at by Karen Fong. And she actually is kind of looking for a hand-drawn look with her title sequence that she created for the television series Rubicon. And this was actually nominated for an Emmy. So it, at the time, this was a really, you know, amazing piece of art um, as far as title sequence goes. And it's basically the main character of the series is an intelligence analyst, and he investigates the suspicious death of his mentor. And he starts to uncover this really wide-ranging conspiracy among the secret society of war profiteer, pro profiteers. And so it kind of the sequence follows this hand-drawn yellow chalk line through lists of data, pages of computer printouts, maps, sensor documents, um, aerial photographs, and other short film clips. And it kind of hints at a person that is searching for connections and clues uh, in various types of evidence. And this is much like the lead character in this series does. So she also does create motion graphics for various other media, including video games and advertisements. But we're going to actually take a look at the still from the book for Rubicon by Karen Fong. This was done in 2010. Um, as you can see, a lot of different typefaces and whatnot. It's really hard to get a feel, a feel for it looking at this, so I'm actually gonna, like I did with, oops, sorry guys, but like I did with the last one, we are gonna take a look at this. So at the time in 2010, this was a good enough where it was, you know, nominated for an Emmy. see it's kind of hinting at connections being made and investigating, which is basically what the main character is doing. So it's actually a pretty short title sequence too. Um, okay, so put this back in presentation mode. So, so we're going to talk about Karen Fong a little bit in the book kind of covers her in a small section and um, animating new narratives. Um, she kind of began, began her design career at a young age. She spent her childhood making her own newspapers and books, and she'd have her dad take him to work and publish them on a Xerox machine, which was basically a really early copy machine. And then she ended up going to Yale and her senior project was an animated children's books, a book. And at the time that she was actually in uh, school, motion graphic design was um, kind of in its infancy. So, and she also became the founder of um, Imaginary Forces, which was a leading motion graphic design firm at that time, um, once she was done with her education. And her specialty is title sequences for movies and television programs. And she always thinks of a title sequence as um, a bit like a curtain opening. It invites the audience to leave the world and go to this other place. Um, and she kind of describes the birth of her project in the book. Um, the proce process usually begins with a conversation with the film's director, then we bounce around ideas. The concept is outlined in the script, and then there's some basic themes to explore. Um, and she said this is one of her favorite stages, the research and design phase where we try to learn about the film. And this is where ideas can really bloom and take off, and it's the most exciting time for her. Um, so it sounded like a, it was pretty interesting that she kind of outlined it um, in this section of the book. And um, She also has designed a trailer for the video game God of War, so she's done video games as well. And she did do a television advertisement for Target. And one of the pieces that she's done that the book kind of covers and actually has a picture of um, is called an info peel. 
Um, and it's a template.